Corpus as a pilot and flying instructor during the Second World War and was still serving in the Air Force in 1953. Well, I was... Uh doing a staff appointment at RAAF headquarters in Melbourne when uh, the opportunity arose to ferry one of four aircraft to uh, Emu Plains, the site of the first atomic uh, explosion. And naturally I jumped to the opportunity to get away from the desk for a few days. The aircraft assigned to John Ashton was the fated A-68-1. So I think that A-68-1, along with a number of other uh, uh, military aircraft, were being held in storage. And uh, when the Air Force was called upon to supply six for this particular job, someone down the line was detailed to pick them out, and uh, A-68-1 just happened to roll out as one of those uh, half dozen. I re recall thinking what a great shame it was that uh, an aircraft in such first-class flying condition had to be used for that particular purpose. The six Mustang aeroplanes were flown out, landed on the clay pan, and we brought them out to uh, array them around the bomb to see what the bomb would do to them with an attempt to protect them. So uh, those aeroplanes were arrayed just here where we're standing, and uh, I put in pegs for each one where they were to go, propeller uh, towards the bomb, tail towards the bomb, side on, uh, mounds of dirt to see if we could protect them. A-68-1 was positioned here. Two Mustangs were positioned in front of the dirt mound, three behind with A-68-1 in the centre, and the sixth was positioned further up the road. At 7am on the 15th of October 1953, the bomb was detonated. Incredibly, the six Mustangs survived. I was completely amazed to see the Mustangs still in existence. When I saw the size of the flash and the shockwave which hit us and the noise and the turbulence and everything else that took place at that millionth of a second, I thought nothing within miles of that bomb is going to be uh, recognisable or even in existence. A-68-1 and the other five Mustangs had survived the greatest destructive force that man could create. Their death sentence was now commuted to life imprisonment. So they were left standing in the desert for the next 14 years, waiting patiently for the man who was to give them back their freedom. Take two sweet little old ladies. Say anything more, dear, till he reads us our rights, like on TV. And... has spent most of his life flying and working with aeroplanes. In 1958, Tony joined the Air Force as an airframe mechanic and at the same time took the chance to gain his pilot's license. Today, Tony Schwert is one of Australia's most highly regarded general aviation pilots. Flying has been my living since, uh, I, I guess, since 1963. Um, and uh, I fly most types of aircraft, um, citation jet, most turbine um, propeller driven types and uh, all the uh, piston engine aeroplanes basically that uh, are available in general aviation. Tony's close involvement with the aviation industry keeps him well informed about aircraft movements and histories. One such story was of special interest. I heard the planes were there by word of mouth uh, so to speak back in the in the very early 60s in fact uh, whilst I was in the Air Force um, the fact that they were there for atomic bomb uh, exposure uh, and um, had just kept an eye on them generally um, up until the point in time when the tender came out. The invitation to tender for the disposal of the abandoned Mustangs was issued by the Department of Supply on the 20th of May 1967. Prior to the submission of tenders, the Department of Supply organised an inspection of the aircraft in the desert of Emu, which had been, up till now, a prohibited area. Tony Schwert was just one of the many interested people who made the long journey to Emu Plains. Uh, my first impression was it was going to be quite a mammoth job after seeing the aircraft, uh, particularly after 14 years 
uh, in the desert here. Although Tony was a little disappointed in their overall condition, his first impressions were soon to be altered. The further I got up the road, uh, the better impressions I've got of the aeroplanes. And um, these two, this particular side of the mound, um, seem to be the best of all. Uh, the mound may have had something to do with um, the condition of the aircraft, I don't know. But uh, certainly they look the best of the six. And this site we're coming up on now, um, where these cement blocks are just here, uh, is where A681, uh, the better of the six aeroplanes, was positioned. While there were several visible scars from her experience, how many invisible ones did she carry? This was a question Tony had to answer before he went any further. The, um, uh, the radiation uh, or possible radiation hazard did concern me. Um, and uh, due to the generosity of the South Australian Police Department, I was able to borrow two Geiger counters, one a low yield and one a high yield. We found that was only a very, very low yield um, indication from the aircraft which meant they were quite safe to, to work on. Now that Tony was happy about the safety of working on the aircraft, he was determined to try one more test while he was there. Tony wanted to see if he could bring A681, or at least her engine, back to life. It seemed incredible to think that after 14 years in the desert, there was any chance at all of the engine still working. But it was here that Tony's skill as an aircraft mechanic came to the fore. The exhaust plugs, fitted to prevent sand entering the engine through the exhaust ports, had either fallen out or been removed many years ago, and the bores were now filled with sand. So he took a gamble and decided to start the engine dry, with no lubrication in the bores. A great sound and it was absolutely marvelous to see uh, sand come out the exhaust for two and a half to three minutes with um, with no damage if we would oiled the bores um, I feel sure that um, we would never have been able to use that particular engine to fly home with despite the enormous excitement of getting a 68-1's engine to start other observers thought you'd have to be a madman to even attempt to fly these planes. I was determined there and then that uh, we were going to fly all these aircraft out. All of them? All of them. In the weeks that were to follow, Tony Schwert's skill and spirit were to be tested to the utmost, as Tony was determined A681 would leave the desert the same way she arrived 14 years ago, under her own power. Tony Schwert had seen enough of EMU during the inspection to realize that this rescue operation couldn't be handled as a one-man show. But setting up a full recovery team in such a desolate location would be prohibitively expensive. So Tony got in touch with Ross Goldsworthy. It started off actually that um, Tony um, told us first of all about the six Mustangs in the scrub there at EMU and that um, he was wondering if I could go in and give him a hand to dismantle them and uh, to remove them. Like Tony, Ross Goldsworthy had served as an aircraft mechanic and fitter in the Air Force. Much of his experience had been gained working on Rolls-Royce and Packard Merlin engines, which were the type installed in the Mustang. I had a big old army blitz which actually belonged to my brother and it had a crane on the back capable of lifting three tonne. It took me 10 hours to get to EMU, it's a 170 mile drive and uh, with the Army Blitz of course we could negotiate the 40 foot high sand hills to get into the area. And, um, but the problem was that the planes were actually at a bomb site which was 12 miles away from any sort of living quarters of any kind. The living quarters Ross referred to was a dilapidated iron hut near the old runway at the Claypan area where Len Bedell had started his original survey and which had been the operation centre of the testing ground. After a week of, of running between the cookhouse where we were living, which was on the airstrip, 
and the bomb site, which were 12 miles apart, it, it became a bit impractical to keep working on the aircraft there. So we decided then that we'd try and tow the aircraft to the actual airstrip, where it would be much more convenient. Uh, it would also save us a lot of petrol, as, as the supply problem was a major one to us. And that, um, so we decided over, I think it took us about uh, a week to tow the six aircraft tail first. Uh, what we did was lift the tail wheel up onto the back of a little trailer, which was attached to the blitz. And then with a couple of steel hawsers to the main wheels, we would pump up the main tyres, which still pumped up even after 13 years in the country, uh, which rather surprised us. All the rubber fell off, but the canvas held. It wasn't as easy as it appeared. We had to, um, with the help of chainsaws, cut down trees either side of the road to facilitate the uh, clearance of the wings. And um, this was a fairly mammoth job, uh, although it was the, the best solution to the, the maintenance problem. With all the Mustangs back at the clay pan, Tony and Ross realised that if they were going to get A681 into the air, they would need to cannibalise many components from the other five Mustangs, and only basic engineering equipment was available. This is a gantry that we constructed out of the old um, control, EMU control tower, and um, waste material which we welded some um, Lincoln bomber tail wheels to. We put a, uh, an RSJ across the top as a beam, uh, and that uh, was able to support a, uh, a block and tackle. Now the work began in earnest. These aircraft had been left standing with water in the system. We found severe corrosion problems with all the uh, water pipes, and um, so major leaks was the real problem to us, and uh, required extensive work in regard to uh, sleeving most of the pipes with large radiator hose type material and clamping at the ends. The same cooling system gave Ross a chance to demonstrate his resourcefulness and ingenuity. The other major problem was we had pinholes, various little fine pinholes in the aluminium pipes and, uh, and the only thing at my disposal at the time was little tiny self-tapping screws and um, cardboard off various wheat big boxes and things like that. So an attempt was made to try and seal the cooling system uh, by this method and um, after several attempts we did succeed. Another problem we had was the mixture of the um, engine and uh, we had considerable trouble with um, the idle mixture being miles too rich. Um, there was a, a possible chance that it would foul up the spark plugs for one thing, which would be very dangerous. And um, so we ended up pulling out the blinking carburetor and taking it up into the cookhouse where we were living. And Tony and I spent a day and a half or so trying to uh, repair this carburetor, although we attempted to, to repair this problem, we, we really didn't succeed. And so mixture strength was far too rich at the idle and uh, we just had to be content with that situation. By this time, Tony and Ross had spent nearly a month alone in the desert. And with the heat, the isolation and depleted supplies, the struggle to keep Tony's dream alive was slowly fading. Isolation does have its own problems, um, particularly uh, from an injury point of view. If, uh, if something was to happen uh, in a place like EMU, um, there was nobody to draw on to, to fly you out or, or give you medical attention. It was really a, uh, uh, a two-man show as it was there um, with Ross Goldsworthy and myself. Uh, one just had to look after oneself. It was also at this time that Tony's father, Charles Schwert, was becoming increasingly concerned. During the whole time, I had a fear uh, for Tony's safety, particularly in view of the fact that he was up there for a whole month on his own, and uh, uh, we had not heard from him. Charles immediately organised a support team to join Tony and Ross and the arrival of this team had a rejuvenating effect. Charles' organisational skill and drive lifted many worries from their shoulders. And with so many extra hands to help, work proceeded at an amazing rate. One of the first tasks Charles and his team undertook was the setup of communications with the flying doctor service should any problems occur. 
each time the giant Packard Merlin engine exploded into life, it seemed to bring Tony's dream a little closer to reality. Yet Tony and Ross were not going to be rushed. After each test, they continued to check, dismantle, replace, test, and check again. By now, the excessive heat over 120 degrees Fahrenheit was causing delays working on the aircraft. Tony, Ross, Charles and all the team had to start early each morning. And by midday, they were forced to take shelter and wait till early evening to resume work. They pulled canvas across the top of the gantry to provide shade, wore socks on their hands to hold spanners. But they persisted and Tony was now ready for his first test flight. But there was one more test still to be done. The aircraft was anchored securely to the ground by a manila rope one and a half inches thick, and Tony prepared to run the engine up to full power. We created a man-made dust storm on this run. It would have been uh, three or four miles across and about eight miles long. And uh, I think it wound up around about five or six thousand feet high. The particular power that we tested it at for some 15 minutes was far in excess uh, of what they were flying in, out in the RAAF. In actual fact, uh, we actually uh, tested it at its top limit. The reason for that was if it could take that sort of um, loading and uh, maintain its integrity, then there'd be no problem with it all flying home. this final ground test with flying colors. Tony had done all he could, and so he prepared both himself and A681 for its first air test. It's worth mentioning that Tony had never flown a Mustang before. Uh, Charles wasn't too happy about me flying. I'm sure that he would like to have sabotaged it or something to stop me getting airborne there at one stage. He said to me, don't worry, it won't worry me at all. I'm quite safe. And when it took off, my fears turned into elation. However, after the fly passed over the top of us, uh, we sort of gained a bit more confidence. I had my hands out feeling for any water or uh, fuel or anything that may be coming out of the aircraft, but uh, she appeared to be quite intact because she was not leaving vapour of any kind behind her. The air tests were very, very successful. Um, the aeroplane performed faultlessly. The only thing that we couldn't do was retract the undercarriage due to the... Uh, the unavailability of uh, certain hydraulic parts and having spent so much time and effort on the aeroplane we didn't want to lose it just because of the undercarriage so it was actually flown wheels down which is truly a great machine all tony had to do now was prepare a681 for her first major flight on his historic flight to Cuba PD using a small dirt track for navigation. I didn't find anything really difficult with letting you uh, follow the, uh, the pilot's handbook. With A681 in more civilized surroundings, Tony returned to Adelaide to make arrangements for the final stage of the resurrection. In order to obtain the necessary documentation, Tony applied to the Department of Aviation. And this routine inquiry was to provide a remarkable irony. For the department officer was none other than A681's original test pilot, Jim Schofield. Uh, I heard that Tony had arrived at uh, Cuba PD from EMU, which uh, was a complete surprise and something of a shock. Uh, to think that he'd done that uh, without uh, any approvals of any sort. I remember very well uh, Jim Schofield, who was the uh, um, 
people who was in charge at the time, um, he was most alarmed and um, said that, uh, well, you've done it now, and uh, I agreed. I said, but uh, I have a lot of money tied up there and, uh, you know, well, we weren't getting anywhere uh, along the normal channels of communication and uh, um, somebody just had to take the bull by the horns and, uh, and that was the only way that uh, I felt we could get some action. That was to fly it from Emu to Cooper. Jim Schofield warned Tony of the consequences of his actions, but at the same time showed bureaucracy can put on a more benevolent face. On the other hand, uh, uh, we also had a role to promote uh, aviation, and I was very happy to dig out my uh, manual of uh, Mustang pilot's notes and the like, and. Uh, lend them to him and uh, arrange to uh, examine him uh, on his uh, engineering knowledge uh, of the Mustang before he could fly it any further. I think um, not only Jim but other people in the department realised that um, the aeroplane must have been airworthy and uh, must have been able to fly the particular type of aeroplane, namely the P-51, otherwise it would never have got from Emu to Cuba Pedy. And, uh, I think generally um, uh, in the department, the fact that they've been subjected to atomic bombs uh, was their main reason for reluctance in, in um, getting things moving earlier. Unaware of the stir she was causing in Adelaide, A681 was being groomed for her epic flight. Ross took the opportunity to correct some faults which had plagued them at Emu. And then we discovered a petrol leak in the engine, which was quite alarming because it meant that the underside of the aircraft became awash with petrol. And uh, in checking out, we found that the diaphragm had ruptured in the fuel pump. And so uh, we had to get a new fuel pump up. A lot of parts were interchangeable from DC-3s, right? So it, it was necessary then to get a DC-3 fuel pump and fit it to the aircraft. Uh, we had another look at the carburetor, but couldn't really do anything about the tune of the carburetor. At the same time, a VHF radio was installed, and the plane was given a general spruce up. Back in the desert at Emu, Charles Schwert again showed his organisational skill. He gathered together a team of engineers and flew them up to Emu. He arranged for road and rail transport to ferry the remaining aircraft back to Adelaide. The Department of Supply had only extended the deadline by a couple of weeks, and the fact that all five Mustangs were dismantled, loaded and transported within that time was a triumph of engineering and logistics. These remaining Mustangs were then shipped to America to be converted into twin-seat executive aircraft. Meanwhile, Tony had passed the engineering examination required by the Department of Aviation, and the way was now clear for him to make the final flight from Cuba Pedy to Adelaide. To escort Tony home, Jim Schofield arrived in Cuba Pedy, and at last he was reunited with A681. Well, when I first saw it, I, uh, I must say it brought a warm feeling uh, to my heart to think that uh, uh, it had come back into uh, activity again as a serviceable aircraft. Um, and uh, you know, I was very impressed with the fact that Tony had done that, even though he'd uh, bent the book a fair bit. It was particularly interesting to find that that was the one that Tony had flown out. The very first one had come to life again. Under the watchful eyes of Jim Schofield, Tony took A681 into the air once more. flight passed without incident. The jubilant reception at Parafield was a fitting climax to months of incredible effort and endeavour. For 
Tony Schwert, it was the realization of a dream. The happy ending he had worked so hard to achieve. For A681, it seemed that fortune had smiled at last. But fate still had a few cards up her sleeve. And she hadn't finished with A681 yet. In fact, the problems were just beginning. By far the biggest problem was the long drawn out struggle to get registration and a certificate of airworthiness so that A681 could once more be legally flown in Australia. As the months dragged by, even Tony's optimism began to wane. This proceeded for, well, the situation, I should say, existed for quite a period of time. Uh, letters going backwards and forwards, um, and the indications were that it seemed it was going to be a very, very slight chance that we were able to ever be able to fly the P-51s in this country again. Because approval was given for the flight from Cooper Petey to Adelaide, it was naturally assumed that registration would follow. However, frustration set in uh, as the months went by without success. Uh, but I must say that at tender time, it was made known that uh, the registration was not likely. However, because of that approved flight, it was believed registration would follow. By now, the struggle had been going on for almost two years, and the vital registration was as elusive as ever. For Tony, the question of finance was now becoming a considerable burden. Obviously, I was in a uh, no-income situation from my point of view, uh, plus the fact that um, I had to borrow a fairly substantial amount of money, as you could appreciate, uh, commuting between uh, Parafield and... Uh, an emu, um, spare parts, etc. Yes, I was fairly committed financially. After two years of mounting financial pressure, Tony Schwert was finally forced to make a bitter decision. The situation in Australia was at the time, both at uh, government level, uh, museum level, uh, and from a private enterprise point of view, nobody here was prepared to pay one dollar for the aircraft. So ultimately, um, uh, to clear myself of some uh, financial problems that I had at the time, the only thing to do was to sell it to the USA. Purchased by an American syndicate, A681 was prepared for yet one more journey, this time by sea. But an even greater irony was in store. Just four days after the sale was negotiated, the long-awaited registration arrived. I um, was not bitter, but I will say that I was uh, absolutely uh, disappointed uh, in the fact that the certificate of registration hadn't been uh, forthcoming earlier. Uh, the fact that it arrived four days after the sale was negotiated was an extreme disappointment. Nine the ship bearing A681 left Port Adelaide for its journey to New York. Although the Mustang was no longer their property, Tony and Charles Schwert had gone to great lengths to ensure that the aircraft had been packed and loaded correctly in order to survive the rigors of its long voyage. After everything they'd been through with A681, a decent send-off was the least they could give her. Yet, despite all their efforts, I now deeply regret to advise you that this entire affair has ended in financial disaster for the aircraft. The wings of this aircraft have been virtually destroyed. The flaps have been ripped, the wingtips have been damaged, the fuselage is damaged on its underside, the canopy is severely cracked. Package number three containing the propellers, etc., was not discharged at Baltimore. In its present state, the aircraft is virtually worthless, except for possible scrap purposes. When uh, I'd heard that the 
aircraft had arrived in America and was damaged um, once again. I just couldn't believe uh, we could have so much bad luck. I personally saw to the uh, shipment and even took photographs at ship's side. There's no way could I believe what was the content of the letter. Regardless of Tony and Charles' disbelief, or Ed Jurist's bitter frustration, and despite the many letters that passed between Australia and America, the sad fact remained that A681, having survived so much, was now in a worse state than when Tony had first found her. The whole affair is a tragic disaster, and we can do nothing now but request recovery of insurance on a total loss basis. And so A681 was abandoned once more, this time for over 10 years, and Tony Schwartz's dream seemed just as forgotten. But in the United States, it became apparent that someone else had taken up the challenge. That person was one of America's leading restorers of vintage aircraft, Darrell Scourge. I believe I first got it about, uh, must have been in 70, 78 probably. Oh, it had been, you know, moved around from place to place, changed hands several times, and every time they moved it, they would lose a part, bang up a part. It was pretty sad shape, really. And when it was in Australia, evidently, uh, I don't know, you know, where it came from there, if it's quite a ways from the water, probably is. But it, uh, it was still crammed full of that red, fine dirt, dust that I guess is prevalent to that area. I didn't really know what airplane it was until I started taking it apart. And on the, uh, the rear bulkhead where the tail cone bolts on, uh, the, uh, there was a, uh, a serial number stamped on there, serial number one. So then I knew, uh, you know, which airplane it was. Well, when I finished it, it was probably the finest Mustang in the country. Uh, I sold, the, the person I built it for sold it to another person. He sold it to somebody else and they wrecked the airplane. And now it's, uh, I guess, in the process of being rebuilt again. I, I haven't seen the airplane since they crashed it. see the aircraft back here uh, and not just as a museum piece stuck in a hangar but back as a flying museum piece.
I think uh, you might say that it was the highlight of my life to, after all the years in the desert, to be able to fly the aircraft. But the opportunity to fly it again, um, well, it would just be something else.